So we're going to wrap up. Uh, we do one more thing from chapter three, uh, and then we're going to move on to chapter four in this class. So we're going to be talking about the balance sheet. But the last tidbit that we didn't do in chapter three um, that you'll probably need for the homework that's due tonight is, let me switch my video. Um, is the statement of changes in, in equity. Statement of changes in well, owner's equity. So, and I will talk, and this is a good, this is a good bridge between chapter three and chapter four because this uh, statement is a really simple statement. You have to memorize it. You have to memorize it, okay? It, but it's really simple. Um, but it is a bridge, it is one of the bridges between the income statement and the balance sheet. And there's a couple of questions uh, in the uh, text for chapter four in particular that make you draw on the statement of changes in owner's equity. <clears throat> okay, so this is the statement, it's really simple. You start with the net income. And so that's your bottom line from the income statement. So you start with your net income. You subtract, and, and, and so this is going to calculate how much more equity does, does the organization that we're looking at have uh, at the end of the year. So let's imagine that this organization had net income of 7,800 at the end of the year, right? So we've done the income statement, we've got their revenues, we have their operating expenses, we have operating revenues, operating expenses, that gives us our operating income, right? Operating revenue, operating expenses, gives us operating income, right? Then we have our non-op, expense uh, uh, gains and losses right and that gives us our net income so this organization we've gone through that that's a super you know that's the structure of our our income statement so you should also have that in your head right <clears throat> so we've gotten to our bottom line uh, of, of net income so we said okay we have net income of seventy eight hundred dollars now, if this is a for-profit company, they have the choice of, so that net income, right, is the residual. We've used that phrase a couple of times. It's the leftover. <clears throat> it's the money that we have left over after we've paid all our bills. So we've gotten paid a bunch of money to do stuff. Sell, we've been selling something, whether that's medical services or medical um, devices or, or um, medical equipment or insurance plans or um, you know uh, days in a long-term care facility whatever it is we've been selling right we've made a bunch of money we've paid all our people we've paid our rent we've paid the interest on our loans right that got us our operating income and then we paid any of the kind of random things that are just part of running a business <clears throat> that are unexpected and, and not necessarily consistent year over year. Maybe we got sued and we had to pay a lawsuit. Maybe we, uh, uh, you know, sold a truck that we were using and we got, and we made a gain on it, or maybe we made a loss on it. And that could be either way. <clears throat> That's our non-operating. So then that brings us to our net income, which is our residual, right? It's the residual meaning what's left over. Owners, are residual claimants, right? We talked about that before. So owners are residual claimants, meaning they have the right to whatever is left over at the end of the, um, uh, uh, of the production process, right? Whatever is left over, that leftover is your net income, okay? So the owners own this. They have, they have the right to that. And the way they can exercise their right is they basically have two choices. What are the two choices? Do you remember? Say again. They can reinvest it or I can't hear. Well, it is profit, right, by, by definition, but what do you so they can reinvest it or they can pay themselves a dividend, right? So they can reinvest it or they can pay themselves a dividend. So there's that money, it's sitting there. The owners have to make a decision. Do we pay ourselves a dividend 
or do we not? Now, what's the difference between them? That's by definition, if you see dividends being paid out, you know that this is a for-profit or a not-for-profit. It's a for-profit, right? Because not-for-profits cannot pay out dividends, right? They have a non-distribution constraint. Remember that phrase? Non-distribution constraint. They are constrained, stopped, from paying out any sort of dividends. So if you see, if I show you a statement of changes in owner's equity, and they're paying out dividends, and I say, is this a for-profit or a not-for-profit? And you see, oh, they paid dividends. You know it must be a for-profit entity because not-for-profits are legally not allowed to pay dividends. Because first of all, there are no owners to pay the dividends to. So it doesn't even make sense, right? <clears throat> so one way to distinguish, if I just showed you, oh, um, so this would be, this next line is less dividends paid. If I put, if I show you 7,800 in net income, less dividends paid of 2,000, what do you know? You now know that we are talking about a for-profit firm, right? Because not-for-profits aren't allowed to do this. Now, not-for-profits have this same statement. They have a statement of changes in owner's equity. The difference is they don't pay out any dividends. Now, if that number is zero, does that mean that it must be, this firm must be a not-for-profit? No, why, Chloe? Exactly, so the, the reason we know that if this number was zero, it could still be a for-profit firm, right? Just, you know, Ali, the owner, has decided she's going to reinvest the whole 7,800 back into the business instead of paying herself um, a dividend, right? So if there's a positive, well, negative number here, right? If there's a payout of, two th of any amount of money, you know it must be a not-for-profit. But if there is a zero there, if there is no dividend payout, it doesn't mean that it's a not-for-profit. It just means it could be a not-for-profit or it could be a for-profit entity that has decided to retain 100% of its income which is not uncommon, particularly in fast growing businesses, right? And we'll get more into that in second semester, <clears throat> but you know, most tech companies, like if you look at Amazon or some of the, you know, some of the, you know, rising company, Uber, they don't pay dividends, right? Any profit that they make, now Uber loses money, so it doesn't have any profit, but, um, uh, but, uh, 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 any 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 profit that those companies make when they're making profit, they just keep and they keep on using it to build the business. Okay, so if you see that, if you see a number there, you know it's a for profit. If it's a zero, it could be a for profit. It could be a not for profit. So that gives us um, uh, our retained earnings. Okay, so retained earnings. So that's. Simple math here, 5,800, right? <clears throat> Retained earnings is the phrase that we use for the money that was kept by the business. So at the end of the year, they had 7,800 in, in, in earnings, in net income. They paid out 2,000 in dividends. So what's left over is what they're going to retain. Okay? So that is going to be put back into the firm. So um, think about, and this is, a good, this is my good transition to chapter four. Think about if you own a house or if you own a car even, right? You have, um, uh, you most likely have a mortgage if it's a house or a, a loan on your car if it's, a, if it's you know, your car. Right? So you have a car loan. So let's say your car cost $5,000 and you took out a $4,000 loan you would have liabilities, right? The loan is a liability, meaning it's something you have to pay, of 4,000, and you would have equity in your car, right? The portion of the car that you own is the 1,000, right? So if we had car, it's worth 5,000, we have a loan for 4,000, right? By implication, 
the car value minus the loan gives you your equity value of 1,000, right? So that's your, that is a statement of your ownership in the car. Now that doesn't mean you have $1,000 that you could spend, right? It just means that that asset, you own 20% of it, one fifth of it, right? But it doesn't mean you, oh, I have $1,000 in the bank. A lot of people get confused when we start to talk about equity, right? Which we will do in chapter four. They, they, they look on the, the, the balance sheet and they see equity and they think that's cash. It's not cash. It's just telling you what portion of the asset, so this is an asset, the car is an asset, right? This is a liability. And then this is your equity, the owner's equity. <clears throat> so here's where it gets, a, our, my metaphor gets a little off. If you made some money, right, this year, and then you decided you paid all your bills and there was some money left over, if you decided you could you pay, want to pay down your um, uh, loan, you could pay another $1,000 and then you would have $2,000 in equity right? $3,000 loan, uh, but the car would still be worth 5,000, right? So the car's, you know, let's assume the car's not depreciating. The car's worth 5,000, right? So you would have an increase in equity of that, of that thousand. Come on. Equity is the owner's portion of an asset. So your so businesses are generally going to be financed, and this is where we're transitioning kind of simultaneously into chapter four. Businesses have assets, right? You go out into, this is one of the first things we talked about in chapter one. What do businesses do? Well, they raise money first, then they go out into the market and buy assets that they use to, to then deliver goods and services. So on the one side, you're going to have the business's assets. You're going to be able to look at the assets. So if you're driving around your car, I can say, oh, Emma owns a $5,000 car. What I can't see as Emma drives down the street looking, you know, looking cool in her, her car is um, how much she actually owns and how much the bank actually owns. The bank might actually own all, all you know, might have all $5,000 worth of the car. Or Emma might have no loan at all and own it completely outright, right? In which case she would have $5,000 in equity. I can't see that. All I can see is the asset that she's driving around. So, um, uh, so likewise with a business, right? A business has assets that it uses to, uh, to, to deliver goods and services to, that it sells, right? And then the ownership of the, the other question we have, which is this side is, who owns the stuff? Right, here's the stuff, the assets, right? So Emma's driving around in her car, right? Just looking at Emma looking cool driving down the street in her, in her you know, uh, used Mercedes or whatever she, she likes. Um, uh, I, don't, um, I don't know how that is owned, but I do know she probably owns some portion of it and the bank probably owns some portion of it because she's a college student, she probably doesn't own it outright. Yeah. Well, then Okay, so Emma's asking with a hospital. We have the building and all the machines and stuff. So that's the assets completely that you see that you can touch, right? So the definition I usually, the way that I, I, I tell you to, to test if it's an asset is can you touch it, right? And for those of you on Zoom, I'm banging on the table, right? So can you touch it, right? Um, can you spend it, right? Or can you sell it? So is it a thing, basically? And so cash is an asset because you can spend it. Right. And there are some other things we'll talk about in a minute that maybe aren't things you would necessarily think of that you could sell, but they are at, they are things that you can sell. And, and we'll get into that. But you could sell, you know, you could sell a table if you owned it. Right. You could sell a building if you owned it. Um, uh, if you have cash, you can spend it. 
So those are, those are, that's a test for assets, right? So the question Emma is asking is, um, let's assume that the hospital is at least partly, partly funded with liabilities with, with some sort of debt, right? So some sort of loans, and then there's equity. And so if they retain, is, are you asking if they retain the asset or retain earnings now? Yep. Yep. So the question is, is this, is the liability, the loan coming from investors? Okay. So that's a, so we need to be careful with our wording uh, on that because banks are technically investors too. So, so yeah, your equity holders, let's call them equity holders as opposed to, uh, as opposed to liability holders. So, um, so the money is the liabilities, the loans, um, it's possible that, that we have people in both categories. So I'm not going to say it's not possible because it is possible and it is, that's a little more complicated, but just for our class, we'll kind of imagine them as two different groups, even though people can have a foot in both places um, in terms of financing. So you would, let's, for simplicity's sake, let's assume those are two different groups of people, um, even though in reality you could have somebody in both. <clears throat> um, so I'm not sure I, I, I've lost the train of thought there. Uh, uh, additional money coming in or... or Yeah. Okay. So are we talking about, so, so we've got a hospital. So let me make sure I understand your question. We've got a hospital and investors want to contribute some money, more money to it. Yes. So the answer is yes, that becomes, so if I'm an investor and I say, I want to give cash to my organization, I want to give it an infusion of cash. I want to add cash to it. Then that would show up as a cash payment over here of whatever cash equals to say a thousand and then over here it would be so it'd be plus a thousand and then over here it would be plus one thousand to owner's equity it's not a loan right it is it is a increase in ownership and so the assets would go up and the owner's equity would go up and this will make more sense in a minute so but that's actually kind of relevant to what we we're just talking about so here in this example, instead of me writing a check as an investor to the organization, I have said to the organization, so there's the Deb, the CEO, reports to me, the owner, uh, we had 7,800 in, in profit, in, in net income. Um, I say to Deb, okay, cut me a check for two, have the CFO cut me a check for $2,000. I want you to keep the rest and reinvest it in new in new resources for the organization. I want you to grow the organization using that 5,800, okay? In that case, what happens is that 5,800 gets added to um, the organization's equity. Okay, so then we have to say, what was our beginning equity? So if our beginning equity was say, why did I pick a funny number? I must have drawn this from somewhere. Uh, 44,308, right? So we have some random amount of equity at the beginning of the year. So this, this business has been in, in operation for some period of time, by definition, because it has net income. But it started the year with an equity balance of 44,308. It retained earnings of 5,800, and so it's ending equity. Is uh, 50,168. That's not. Yeah, that's right. 5,800 plus 44,308 is 50,168. I need to rewrite this example. So it has less weird numbers, but. <laughs> okay, so that's that's the statement of changes in owner's equity. We start with the net income, we pay out dividends or not. That could be a that could be zero, or it could be up to the full value of the net income. Okay, so they could pay out seventy eight hundred in 
in, in dividends, in which case they would pay out 100%. Uh, they would have a dividend rate of 100%. But if they pay out something less than 7,800, there's going to be some amount of retained earnings. So you subtract the dividends paid from the net income, that gives you your retained earnings. Your retained earnings is added to the beginning equity balance. So at the beginning of the period, at the beginning of the year, you have some amount of equity in the business. Even if it was a brand new business at the beginning of the year, this was the first year this business ran, you know, if this was Chloe's business, um, uh, uh, then, um, she would have contributed some amount of equity like Emma was talking about a minute ago to start the business. She, even if it was just a thousand dollars, she would have put a thousand dollars into the business, maybe taken out some loans, right? But either way, her starting, if, if it was a thousand dollars, if she'd started the business with a thousand dollars, her beginning, beginning equity would have been a thousand dollars if she retained earnings of 5,800, her ending equity would then be 1,000 plus 5,800 would be 6,800. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's all there is to it. It's really a pretty simple statement, but you have to memorize this one. So it's net income minus dividends equals retained earnings. You add the beginning equity to the retained earnings and you get the ending equity. It's, it's, it's simple. Unfortunately, a lot of folks forget to, don't, don't, don't memorize it. And then I ask the question. Just um, to clarify. The beginning yes. equity and the ending equity, that's equity that like the company has, not that the investors have in the company, right? Is ending, equity? I'm sorry, say, say it again about the equity. Sorry. Um, well, the, both equity terms, that's like how much the company has like in ownership, not how much the investors have of equity in the business, right? So the equity is a statement of ownership by the owner assets. in the business, right? So, okay. so it's, it's a dollar amount. It doesn't say it's not a percent. It, it can be put into a percentage terms, but it's the dollar amount um, of equity that you own in the business. So for, you know, going back to this, ex this example here, right? You have that car and it's worth 5,000. You have a loan for 4,000. You have equity of 1,000. That tells you that you own 20% of the car. So that's what, the equity is if at the if you paid down, you know if you paid in another thousand dollars in cash to the bank, right? Your loans would go down by three thousand, and your equity would go up to two thousand. So the equity is is the dollar amount um, measurement of the uh, of the assets owned by the uh, by the investors. So you can think about on the asset side, when we talk about, so we're gonna start talking about balance sheet, and we've kind of been talking about it already, um, because what I'm showing you right here is a simplified balance sheet. Um, assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity is the essence of the balance sheet. So what the owner's equity tells you is, how much of the asset value is owned by the owners, and how much of the asset value is owned by the debt holders. So at, in this case, we could convert this to a percentage and say 80% of the business is, is funded by liabilities and 20% is funded by owner's equity. And then as it changes, now we're down to 60% li liabilities and 40% owner's equity. Does that make sense, Caitlin? Yes, thank you. It'll, it'll make more sense as we talk about it. So we're gonna keep talking about that idea too. So. If it doesn't make sense just yet, it will. So you need to retain this, right, um, and remember it. All right. So we talked about the income statement in chapter three, and we said that the income statement is a flow document, right? Income statement equals a flow document, it means that we're capturing the flow of money over time. So we're saying from time one to time two, how much revenue did we earn? From time one to time two, how much expenses did we have? From time one to time two, what was our profit? So it's a flow over time. The balance sheet is known as a stock document. 
and it is a snapshot it's funny i have like a certain degree of dysgraphia when i'm when i'm talking and writing at the same time uh and my hand gets doing something other than my mouth is saying uh so i periodically have to kind of look at what i'm writing um, but a, a balance sheet is a, is a snapshot in time. So whereas an income statement is flowing over time, a balance sheet is a, how much do I have right now or at time X? So on um, September 29th, how much cash do I have in my business? On September 29th, what is the value of the liabilities? On September 29th, how much equity does my organization, how much equity do I have in my organization, right? On September 29th, how much is the equipment that I have worth, okay? So those are the, so it's a different question than the income statement would say, from January 1st to December 31st, how much money did I make? So the income statement is a statement over time, the balance sheet is a snapshot in time. So the balance sheet is like, seeing your bank statement or you know going to the atm and saying what's my balance right the balance sheet is basically answering the question what's my balance right now okay so when you see them presented they're always going to say balance sheet as of this 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 date whatever that date might be um income statement is always going to say for some period of time so um Really, the balance sheet is a summary of, uh, on the one hand, of uh, the resources the organization has, and then on the other hand, the claims against it. So on one hand, we have the resources of the organization, and on the other side, we have the claims. And it's a balance sheet, um, so it's like, you know, so for those of you in Zoom land, right, you know those, like the scales of justice, you have this, Somebody's got a little hand and they're holding right, they're holding the scales and you put some stuff in this one, right? And it makes it go down. And then if you put some stuff in this one, then it makes it go back up again, right? So that's balanced. So you know if you're if if you're in balance, they're both here, but if they're out of balance, right, they go like that. So with the balance sheet, we have to have it is always true that what's on the left side is equal to what's on the right side. So the resources we're going to refer to as assets. Right? So these are the things that the organization um, has to do its business. That might be buildings, equipment, could be vehicles, it could be um, uh, uh, laboratory equipment, right? It could be uh, desks and chairs, it could be you know, if you're a pizza shop, it's your ovens and your, um, you know, uh, if it's uh, in your cash register, right? It's whatever. So think when you think asset, think, can I touch it? Could I sell it? Right. Um, uh, uh, or could I spend it? And if you can answer yes to those three things, then you're talking about an asset. Okay. So. On this side is the assets. On the other side are the claims. And who has claims on the assets? So who has claims on the assets? Well, you have your, your uh, liability holders. Or these are your lenders. More officially, liability holders. So lenders have claims on the assets. So if you have, uh, if you own a car, and you know that car cost you four five thousand dollars you got a four thousand dollar loan and you've got a monthly payment of however much you know 100 bucks a, a month and you're like you know it's really a drag to pay the pay that hundred dollars a month i'd much rather keep it and go down to you know uh aroma joe's and buy myself a, a cute you know double latte half calf whatever thing that you guys are always drinking um you know you could get away with that one month and the bank will send you a, a nasty note saying, hey, you didn't pay us. You might get away with it a second month um, and then they'll get send you a, a, a meaner and longer nasty note. And then come the third month, you're gonna come out in the morning um, one day uh, to get in your car and you'll see a tow truck driving away with your car on the back, right? Because the repo man has come. 
<clears throat> the bank has a claim on those assets, right? So you can think about it, that is an example of, of a uh, claim right, on the asset. So the, the, the lender has a claim on your car. So what they do is they take your car um, and they might threaten you one more time and then they say, we're gonna auction your car. Um, they auction your car and they keep whatever they get uh, uh, toward your loan. So if you had a $4,000 loan and they auction your car and they get $3,000, they keep the 3,000. If they get 4,500 for it, they, they pay the, um, uh, they give you $500 less the cost of the repo man. So maybe you get 50 bucks. <clears throat> so if you fail to pay your liabilities, the claim, the, the liability holder has a claim on the assets and sometimes they can come and you know take those assets. If you have a, um, uh, you know, if you borrow money to to uh, uh, run a business um, uh, to buy, say, a building, they come, you know, and you don't pay the bank, they will you will show up one morning, and they will the bank will have put you know a chain on your front door, and you can't get in, right? So uh, until you start making payments or you figure out something with the bank. So it's usually a bad idea to ignore the bank when it says you need to pay us something. What's going on? Why aren't you paying us? Um, okay, so they have a claim on the assets. And then the owners have a claim on the assets. So this is your equity holders. Which is kind of what we've been talking about with the car, right? So these two things have to add up to that, right? In order for these sides to be in balance. So if I have a $5,000 car, and I have a $1,000 loan, oh, and that's it's a $4, let's say $4,000 loan, I therefore have $1,000 in, in equity, right? because that adds up to 5,000, and that adds up to 5,000. This is called the total liabilities and owner's equity. So it's just simple addition, right? It's it's the the loans plus the equity gives us the total liabilities and owners equity, and then this is total assets, and those have to add up. They have to add up. If they don't add up, you've done something wrong. The equity very often is kind of this mushy number that adjusts based on um, the asset value and the loan value. So it, so. Um, Usually with property, like a house, right, your hope is you buy the house for some amount of money, let's say $100,000. You take out a loan, an 80% loan, so you have a loan of $80,000, and you have, therefore, have equity of how much? $100,000. So my house, $100,000. My mortgage, 80,000, so my equity must be 20,000, right? Because this has to equal this, so that my numbers are in balance, right? Now what you hope to happen is over time, and I'm just gonna assume you're, you know, for the, well, let's say over time, you make payments on your mortgage of let's say $5,000 over time. Let's say your house doesn't change in value at all, which is not what you hope. If you've paid down your mortgage $5,000, then your mortgage is now 75,000, right? And your equity is how much? 25, right? 100 minus 75 is 25. Okay. So the equity is kind of this mushy thing that changes based on what else is going on with the asset value and the liabilities values. Okay. Now, buying a house, one of the things you hope is that you're going to have, your house is going to appreciate in value from inflation, from just, you know, population growth, whatever. And so maybe your house goes up to, Let's say right now, 
You know, so this is scenario one, scenario two. Scenario three is the house goes up to, increases to $125,000 in value. You still have a mortgage of 75,000, so therefore your equity is 50,000. 125 minus 75 gives me 50. The equity very often is the thing that changes to balance out the balance sheet, okay? <clears throat> so the simple formula is assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. I'm gonna abbreviate it OE so I don't have to write it out. So assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. Now this is an identity, meaning if you go back to your math you know, classes, it's an identity meaning this is by definition true. So we can assume that it's true, right? It's like saying two plus two equals four. All right, so this is, this is an identity, it must be true. So we can rearrange this a little bit if it's useful to you. And you could say assets minus liabilities equals owner's equity, which is kind of what I was doing without writing it out up here when I was showing you, okay, I've got 125,000 in assets, I've got 75,000 in liabilities, what must my equity be? I basically was doing this in my head, you guys were doing it in your head too, right? So really you just need to remember this is true and then you can maneuver it however you need to. You could also say, well, assets minus owner's equity is equal to liabilities, whatever. You need to know that this is the basic definition of a balance sheet, okay? Now typically, well, not often, a balance sheet is laid out with a left side and a right side. The left side being assets, the right side being liabilities, owner's equity. It helps visually to do that, but you can also see them, you also see them often with uh, assets on top and liabilities and owner's equity on the bottom. Regardless, this is always expressed as a total of liabilities and owner's equity, and then you have a total of assets. Those two things must add up, right? Or else you are violating the basic identity. So on the exam, if you're writing, you know, um, I give you a problem with a bunch of you know, things that are probably assets, a bunch of things that are probably liabilities, and a bunch of things that are that are probably equity, right? And I say, make me a balance sheet. When you put all the thi all the pieces in place and you add the two sides up, if they don't equal, you've done something wrong. Okay, so that's just kind of something you need to know. But it's really these this liabilities and owners equity is simply a claim, a statement about who has a claim and how much of the, of the business's assets, right? You can think of lenders as claimants and equity holders as claimants on the assets, right? We keep talking about the equity holders as being residual claimants. So in a way, right, that makes sense when we talk, you know, because we've been talking about them as residual claimants uh, in the income statement as well. And it kind of works that way. All right, um, so you're driving down the street, right? And, and um, you know, another example, you're driving down the street, you look out the window and you see this cute house that, you're, and you're like, I'd like to live in that cute house. Um, uh, and you go on your, on your phone and you go on to Zillow. Anybody ever go on Zillow? I know you guys are young, like this is an old person thing to do. Okay, so you go on Zillow and you're like, or maybe, you know, you've got a, a friend's house or, you know, potential boyfriend or girlfriend. And you're like, hmm, you know, I wonder how much their house is worth. Are they, are they worth dating? None of you guys would be that callous, right? You're all about, you know, the inner beauty of the people that you date, right? not their wealth or, or their external beauty. Um, uh, but, you know, you go on to this, so if you're an old person like me and you enjoy these things, you know, you drive, you're like, I wonder what Bob's house is worth, you know, and you look it up and, and it's, you know, it's Bob's house is, house is worth $500,000. That's the asset value, right? That's the asset value. What you can't see from Zillow is how much of a loan does Bob have on his house, right? That's not on Zillow. 
So all you can see from Zillow is the asset value. Right, but and then Bob, if the house is worth five hundred thousand, Bob might have a loan of of two hundred fifty thousand. He might have a loan of a hundred thousand. He might have a loan of five hundred thousand. You know, he might have zero. You know, he might have put zero down. Um, so you know, that's kind of the um, uh, the basic idea uh, of a balance sheet. So now let's look at let's start to look at. <clears throat> um, the structure of a balance sheet. So we've been, I've been talking, what I've been showing you in terms of like the car, I've been talking about the house, right? Those are, those are, those are accurate representations, but we're gonna get a little more detailed now, okay? So the basic breakdown of the balance sheet is the balance sheet has an asset side and I'm going to typically show it as, a, again, I'm going to typically show it as a left-right. It doesn't have to be left-right. It can be above and below. But the two, the, two um, the assets are always clustered together, and the liabilities and owner's equity are always clustered together. And whether you put them side by side or above and below, it doesn't matter. It, to, you know, for teaching purposes, it's easier to do left-right. <clears throat> the asset side has, the basic asset side has, two categories of assets. Current assets, which I'll occasionally abbreviate C slash A, and long-term assets, which you'll see me abbreviate LT slash A, or LTA, right? And that gives us our total assets. So the basic structure of the balance sheet is there's this, the first part of the asset side, so you have the assets, the first part of the asset side is always the current assets, then below current assets comes long-term assets. This actually matters, so you need to remember this, okay? When I give you a problem and I say, build me a balance sheet, and I give you a bunch of assets, you're going to have to distinguish within reason between the long-term assets and the current assets. So I'm going to give you a rule for that right now. Okay? The rule for is it a current asset is will it be used within one year or can it be used within one year. So you might have an asset, a current asset, that you don't use within a year, but it's current if it could be used uh, within a year. So examples of current assets. Professor? Current of current assets. And these are- Is that a measure of uh, liquidity? Is that what yes. you're trying to figure out? I'm sorry. Is uh like uh, measuring current assets? Is that like a measure of liquidity, essentially? Exactly. I was about to say that another way of saying current assets is liquid assets. So so exactly the right you are using the correct um, uh, 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 vocabulary there. So current assets are our most liquid assets, and we'll talk about measures of liquidity. Um, as we go forward. But the idea of a liquid asset is that it can be used quickly, right? So the most liquid asset is what? Is that John? Or is that Cole? I can't, there's only two guys, so it must have been one or the other. Unless yeah. Saffron someone got a really deep voice. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the most liquid asset, do you know? All right, cash, cash. cash. I I'm saying cash. Okay, good. Cash, right? Cash is the most liquid asset. What do I mean by liquidity? Really what I mean by liquidity is how quickly can I convert something into cash? Right? So that's another way of saying this. How quickly could I convert this something into cash? That's not quite the, for the, the, the formal question really is, is it, is it, can it be converted into cash within a year? Well, you could convert almost anything into cash within a year, so you don't want to really use that 
as a, as an operating definition. But so I would rather you focus on is this thing going to be used within a year or can it be used within a year? So the most liquid asset is cash. The most current asset is cash. Why? Because you can spend it immediately. Right? It doesn't. Nothing needs to be sold. Right? Nothing needs to be done to it. You can just start writing checks. If the money is in the checking account, you can write checks. <clears throat> now, just because you have checks doesn't mean you can write checks. Right? We all know that. Right? Like we have. When I, you know, this is kind of a joke. When I was in the army, you know, young soldiers would come in, and they would think because they have still have checks in their checkbook that they can keep writing the checks. You know even though there's no money in the bank account and they run into these kind of problems. So that's kind of a standing joke in, in the army. Um, teaching young people how to, you know, a lot of young people come into the military and they don't have any sense of financial management and they, and you know, it's their first time uh, trying to do that and they make a lot of mistakes. But uh, uh, so cash, most liquid asset. Another example, inventory, or supplies. This is an example, right, of something that you're going to most likely use up within a year, or you could use up within a year. So think about your current assets, right? You're not thinking, I mean, I, when I've been talking about assets, I've been talking about, you know, I've generally been talking about buildings and cars and, and tables and stuff like that. But your inventory is also an asset. Right? Can you touch it? Yes, I can touch the back, the box of band aids. Right? I can touch the the vials of of flu mist. Those are assets. They are assets in the sense that they are supplies or in or inventory. And I'm going to be loose with that because we're not a we're the our business is primary not primarily about selling stuff. It's about selling services. So we're a little looser with how we define that. But <clears throat> but um, inventory. Your, the stuff that you're going to use to do your business is considered a current asset, right? Um, because it's going to be used up within a year. It would also be relatively easy to convert it into cash. You could sell it or you could return it back to the supplier right, and convert it into cash. So that's another example um, of a current asset. So when we, get, when we start to list the current assets, and we will, we'll break, we're not gonna just list current assets. We're gonna have cash, then we're gonna have supplies or inventory, right? And then we're going to have um, another category is current investments. So current investments, so a hospital will literally have cash in its building, right? because it needs cash to do stuff like run the cafeteria, right? So that's probably the biggest, most people don't pay cash for their doctor's visits, even if it's a $20 copay. Most people don't pay cash, but some people do. So you have that cash coming in. But most of what we define as cash for an organization, for a business, is not physical cash, it's their checking account. It's the money in the checking account. So money in a checking account, even though you aren't touch it, physically touching it, is considered cash. Okay, so the cash balance for an organization that goes under current assets is going to be the physical cash in, you know, in the organization, in its safes, in its cash registers or whatever, plus whatever it has in its checking account. Then, an org question? Okay. Um, then it's going to have some things that it wants to keep Businesses want to keep a certain amount of money on hand, not necessarily for day to day, but just kind of like as a rainy day fund or, you know, to handle um, uh, uh, the random uh, changes in needs. Um, and so it will keep an additional kind of, you know, uh, extra fund in something that's near cash, but not cash. Why wouldn't you want to keep so my advice to you young people is, you know, when you graduate and you get that wonderful first job working at Boston Children's or wherever it is you want to work and you start making money, right? One of the things I will tell you, I, I tell you as a, you know, as a father of, of three young people is you want to set aside, one of the first things you should start to do is set aside a rainy day fund, right? an emergency cash fund equal to about three months worth of expenses. So that 
if you were to lose your job all of a sudden, right, you could keep paying your rent. You could keep paying your car bill so that the repo man doesn't show up and tow your car away. You want to have about three months worth of experience because you, you never know what's going to happen. You're going to, you know, uh, yesterday I had, um, uh, I had some uh, uh, um, uh, alumni, young alumni, five years out, come talk to the seniors. We had a Zoom meeting. They, they talked to the seniors about kind of dealing with organizational chaos. So these kids, young folks, um, a little bit older than you, right? Uh, I happen to know they had gone through, they each had gone through three reorganizations in their first job. So they wound up like their their department got wiped out, their boss got fired, and then they got reallocated someplace else. You know, could have just have been just as easy because they were the, you know, low men on the, te- well, low man and low woman on the te- totem pole. They could have lost their jobs, you know, just as easily. Um, but they were young enough and low paid enough that they just shuffled them to someplace else in the organization. But that happens, right? And it's not even your fault, right? It's like, you know, Emma might be working really hard and doing a great job, um, and, but the overall business is, is doing poorly, and, they're, and the CFO says we have to cut expenses, and they start looking down the list, and they're like, oh, yeah, we'll just cut the department, uh, you know, where Emma works. And then the, you know, the COO shows up, you know, the next morning with, a, with envelopes for, for, you know, with, a, with two weeks severance pay for Emma and all her friends, right? And you're gone. So you ought to, when you graduate, you ought to assess what are my monthly expenses, and then you should be building up a, uh, a three-month um, uh, 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 kind of rainy day fund. Now, if you do that, do you, you don't want to put it in your checking account. Why not? It doesn't make any interest, right? So you're not going to spend this money, right? It's not for day-to-day business, which is what you would keep in your checking account. You want to keep in your checking account enough money to pay your, your ongoing expenses, but you're continuously replenishing that. This other, this rainy day fund, you want to set aside and you're not going to touch it, right? It's, it's meant for an emergency fund. But that said, you don't want to put it in, a, in, a, in an account that yields no interest. Well, businesses do the same thing, okay? Businesses have what amounts to a rainy day fund that they put Uh, They put aside so that they have cash on hand in case something bad happens, right? But they also keep, and and so the treasurer in an organization, right, who works under the CFO, you know, um, the treasurer in an organization manages the amount of cash that an organization keeps on hand. And I had the treasurer of a, uh, the first time I taught a finance class, I had the treasurer uh, it was an MBA finance class, and I had the treasurer of a large, um, I mean, it was the deputy treasurer of a multinational um, uh, uh, um, uh, computer chip maker. I was teaching in Austin at the time. And, and so we had some interesting conversations. Because I was explaining this, and he's like, yeah, I do that. And it was like, yeah, not only do I do that, but, I, but because we're a multinational, I have to manage um, the cash uh, in multiple currencies because I have to because we have plants in Korea and uh, and someplace else like Germany or something like that. So we had to manage how much cash do I need in Deutschmarks or or euros? How much do I need in um, I forget what the Korean? Uh, uh, does somebody know, what is it? And he has to pay attention to the exchange and he has to manage the exchange rate. It's a really complicated thing, right? Um, but basically, he, has to, he had to manage that, that question of how much cash do I need to keep the business floating, but no more than that. Because if I keep more cash on hand than I need, I'm not earning interest on, on, the, on the rest of that cash, or my business is not taking that cash and putting it into real investments like building a new plant. So if I have too much cash, I'm being too conservative right? If I don't have enough cash, I'm at risk of not being able to pay my bills. That's a real question that businesses deal with and they try to manage. Yeah, Emma. The question is, can the business put it into an account whether they earn interest, but maybe not pay as much. No, nah, I mean, yeah, there's a, there's a whole lot of strategies around tax management and, and, and interest management. We'll talk more about that in, in. 
So, so the, so is it more helpful to have that money um, than, than have it, sorry, then. Okay, so is it more helpful or hurtful? So the, so the business, just like you, you were saying, you have some money in CDs. Businesses also use CDs. Um, businesses also use, uh, 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 and we'll talk a lot more about the details of this in, in finance too, but treasury bills and other, sh these are called short-term investments or current investments that are not cash, they're not checking accounts, but they are highly liquid, meaning I could fairly quickly, within a day or two, liquidate those, you know, those assets um, and, and have the cash available. So that is an example of a current investment. So probably more common than CDs, though businesses do use CDs to, for this rainy day fund, is um, uh, short-term government securities, so what are called treasury bills. They, are, they have like 30-day, 90-day uh, expirations. They pay very low interest, um, uh, but they pay some interest as opposed to zero interest. And so some interest is better than zero interest, particularly when you're talking about, say, $100 million or something like that, right? Um, so businesses are constantly managing their cash between cash, true cash, where they get zero interest, and short-term or current investments where they earn some interest. But even there, again, the point is we only want to have enough cash to manage our day-to-day -day businesses. That would be the cash, right? And then uh, enough in current investments, right, in addition to our checking account, have it in these short-term investments to cover our what we would estimate are our rainy day needs. And then the rest should go into either long-term investments, which is like owning stocks and bonds, or it should be invested in physical assets, the real, what, and, and I'm using this in a technical sense, what are called real assets. And real assets are, are the you know, physical things that we can actually touch, the things that the business uses to do. So there's a difference between a real asset, which is like property, plant, and equipment, and, a, and financial assets, which are, say the business buys mutual funds or it buys, it buys stocks, so the financial instruments. Right, as opposed to as opposed to real assets, which we call real property, you'll hear that phrase means physical things that you use to, to do your business. Emma. Right. 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 So so Emma said you only want to keep the three months. Exactly. I mean, if you have four months or five months, fine. You're being more conservative, right? But because you are keeping that five months worth of cash in a, in a CD, for example, you're not buying a nicer car. You're not, you know, taking a trip to, to Hawaii with your, with your girlfriends, right? So, so there's, a cost, there's a real cost to having that excess money. So you need to figure out, you know, three months is a good, for a young person is a good marker because you're young and you're flexible, right? But it's a good marker to be like, okay, if I lose my job, I don't have to freak out and take the first available job. You want to have um, uh, uh, so, uh, the ability to go on the market, apply to a couple of different places, and pick the best one rather than the first thing that somebody throws at you, right? Uh, another, another. Uh, there's a guy named Nassim Taleb who I'm a big fan of. He, he's um, a, uh, he's a, a, an investor who's turned sort of philosopher, and he writes a. He's got a lot of great books, uh, one of which is called The Black Swan. Highly recommend his stuff, um, uh, Fooled by Randomness. A bunch of great stuff you should read. But he talks about having, all right, so this is, uh, 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 I'm going to up, up this to PG. He calls it having fuck you money. Um, so, right, which means I have, if, if my boss really pisses me off or I'm getting harassed or something like that, I don't have to stay because, if I don't stay, I'm living paycheck to paycheck and I'm just, uh, I won't be able to feed myself. Having this stash of this rainy day fund isn't just if you lose your job, it also allows you to walk away from a bad situation, right? So I'm not gonna say that word again, but, um, but you, you get the idea, right? Is, is if you have this cash stash on hand and you're in a bad situation, you can walk away from that rather than stay. So you don't wanna be stuck in a situation that you don't wanna be in. And so that also gives you that ability. Now, you don't want to quit every, every other job that you go to, right? That starts to look bad. But you want to be able to do it if you have to. And so that's another example, just personal level. But businesses have these things. 
So those are three examples um, of, uh, of uh, current assets. <clears throat> Another current asset that's going to be important um, is accounts receivable. So these are still current assets. Accounts receivable, which I'm going to abbreviate A slash R. So an account receivable um, is an IOU, okay? So we talked about the fact that our business is not running on a cash basis, it's running on an accrual basis. So on an accrual basis, we book the revenue on the date that the service or good was provided, right? So we're running a hospital and um, we have a patient come in and we provide them care. Maybe they have a copay that's due the day of, maybe they don't, you know, but most likely we're gonna book, let's say $1,000 for an MRI, right? They come to Wentworth Douglas, we do an MRI on them, that's a, we bill them $1,000. We bill them, right? We don't, we don't say, please hand me your credit card. We say, please hand me your insurance card, right? And then we, we make a bill that then gets sent to the insurance company. We don't expect to actually be paid by the insurance company on the day that the um, uh, service is rendered. We expect to be paid probably 30, 45, 60 days from the date of service being rendered. Okay. So that means that we've got this IOU out there basically from the insurance company, right? So we bill, we, so we, we book revenues of a thousand dollars. Maybe we collect a hundred dollars from the patient day of. So in that case, we got cash of a hundred day of, but we have now an account receivable of 900. So the visit, we build a thousand dollars in revenue. We received a hundred dollars in cash. That's a current asset. Right? And then we received an IOU from the insurance company in the form uh, uh, worth $900. So our current assets from that visit, right? We get revenue equal to a thousand. That's that goes on to the income statement. And then over on the balance sheet side, we have cash of plus 100 and accounts receivable of plus 900, right? Which totals up to the 1,000. So we've booked $1,000 in revenue. We really only got $100 in cash. So the rest is in this accounts receivable. Every healthcare organization is heavily reliant, like 98% reliant, you know, uh, or, or I should say not every, the average healthcare organization is like 98% reliant on third-party payment, right, insurance. And so the average healthcare organization always has a large accounts receivable going. Now, why is it a current asset? Well, I defined current assets a minute ago as being, will it be used within a year or can it be used within a year, right? Well, we expect the accounts receivable, the, the, the individual accounts, right? So we have this one account is for the $1,000, right? There are many accounts in our accounts receivable. This particular account is worth $1,000. I expect it to be paid within 30 to 45 days which is less than a year. So therefore it is a current asset. That particular account within the accounts receivable, the overall accounts receivable, is a current asset because I expect it to be liquidated, turned into cash within 30, 45 days. That makes it well under a year, right? So that's why accounts receivable is an asset. The other thing about accounts receivable, right? <clears throat> the other thing about accounts receivable is you can sell accounts receivable is a process called factoring. I'm not gonna test you on this, but you should know it. And part of the reason why it's considered a current asset. 
accounts receivable, so I've got all these IOUs. If I have an urgent need for cash and I have all these IOUs, I can basically sell them to what amounts to a debt collector. It's polite, you know, I can factor these um, uh, uh, to to a, a uh, to a business that specializes in, and, and there are different ways to do this. I can literally sell the accounts, in which case, you know, Deb came and used my hospital. Um, I have an urgent need for cash. I can sell Deb's account to Taylor, and then Taylor will call Deb and say, "You don't owe, you don't owe um, uh, Bonica Memorial any more money. You owe me the money." Um, that's one variation on it. Alternatively, I had Deb came and used my hospital. I, Deb has none, done nothing wrong in this case, right? Just she's just used my hospital, and 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 then her insurance company's going to pay me. Hasn't paid me yet. I'm in financial straits. Taylor looks at my accounts receivable and says, "Oh yeah, I see you have a an outstanding um, bill from Deb. It's probably not going to be paid in 30 days. I will make you a loan against Deb's um, $900 account receivable, um, and uh, and then you you know I will give you $850 toward Deb's account uh, because Deb is pretty reliable. When Deb pays her account, you give me the 900, right?" So the way that Taylor makes money is she lends me 850 and I pay her 900 when the money comes in. So those are kind of two different ways. Uh, so you can sell it, you can, you can kind of get a loan on it. There's a variety of different ways that businesses can um, uh, uh, take advantage of the, of the liquid nature of accounts receivable. So accounts receivable, another current account. Um, talked a little bit about inventories. For a healthcare organization, that's mostly medical supplies. Um, so, uh, so those are the main ones we're going to see. Uh, cash, main ones we're going to see for current assets are going to be cash, uh, accounts receivable, uh, inventory or supplies, Um, and uh, short-term or current investments, short-term investments or current investments. So those are probably, those are four that you should just know, right? You don't have to memorize it, but you ought to be able to look at a list of, of things and be like, oh yeah, cash, current asset, because I'm going to do that. I'm going to give you a list of, of things. And I'm going to say, sort those out into current and long-term assets. Okay? So you would then sum up and you'd get, Total current assets, which would be the first part of the asset side of the balance sheet. The next part is your long-term asset. So let's talk about what goes, what are um, long-term assets. Short-term investment or a, is, is the same as a current investment. So I was using kind of the, the terminology. We can kind of go back and forth between those. So a short-term investment would be, as opposed to cash, is going to be a CD, um, a treasury bill, something other than cash that can be liquidated, turned into cash overnight or in a couple of days. So if I own treasury bills, I can't just... I can't take a treasury bill down to, to um, Sammy's and buy a Coke, right? I have to sell the treasury bill in order to get the cash. Now there is a market for treasury bills that is in the trillions of dollars every day. They, they trade hands constantly, right? U.S. treasury bills are, are, are highly liquid um, and are near cash in the kind of global financial market, but you can't go down to downtown Durham and, and, and hand Sammy a, a treasury bill. Right, um, he wouldn't know what to do with it. Uh, well, he might know what to do with it, but he's not going to take it because that's not his, the nature of his business. Right? Um, <clears throat> so, so you're differentiating cash versus kind of your short-term or, or current investments. Current investments being things like CDs and, and treasury bills. Okay? That's your rainy day fund money going to go in there. All right. So now we have long-term investments. And those break down into financial or real 
investments, which is what we talked about a minute ago. Now, financial investments are, of course, real in the in the kind of secular sense, right? They're they're real, um, but we use real in this technical sense to refer to physical, the stuff of the that the business is using to do its business. The business has may have financial investments like stocks and bonds that it's hanging on to and not-for-profit hospitals tend to have a significant um, uh, 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 um, amount of money in um, financial assets uh, because they are expected to self-finance a lot of their um, uh, construction and other needs. Um, so you have um, these financial assets and then you have real assets. So let me talk about um, financial assets first. They're less important for us. Uh, there's some technical stuff that I'll talk about that I'm not gonna zing you on too much, but you should kind of have a general idea of it. So financial assets, starting with financial assets, and then we'll come to real in a minute because real is actually more important for our, for our, our discussion. Um, Financial assets are reported at market value. And that's important because real assets are not. So financial assets are reported at market value. Um, uh, this is one of the few exceptions on the balance sheet. Everything else on the balance sheet, pretty much everything else on the balance sheet, um, is reported at historical value. Uh, and we are about out of time. So uh, we will pick up, uh, so let me, let me finish that thought and then we'll stop. Um, no, no, we're gonna, I'm gonna stop because I ran over last time. All right, we'll pick up there next time. We'll start talking about financial assets. All right, thank you. Thank See you. you tomorrow. Hey, thank tomorrow, you. folks, folks uh, it's little, tomorrow is, um, is gonna be a virtual class. I will say that again.